So today I wanted to share with you one of my favorite Bible stories. So this is the story of the Good Samaritan. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan was traveling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So as I said, the parable of the Good Samaritan is one of my favorite Bible stories. Um, of all time. It's actually one of the most famous parables of Jesus and it's found only in the Gospel of Luke. So what I want to do today is first I want to say if you ask how famous is the Good Samaritan, I want to answer that question. Okay, this is how famous this parable is. I also want to go a little bit into the story and some of the main elements of the story. What are some of the key points that we can see to understand why this story is so significant? And then I want to end, of course, by giving a couple of great examples of modern-day Good Samaritans. Um, so first off, how famous is the Good Samaritan? I always think that a story is famous when it becomes part of our vernacular. So if you watch the news sometimes, you'll see a Good Samaritan story on the news. Sometimes it seems like we never get good news, but occasionally we do. And you see the Good Samaritan stories, and that's often the headline. But what I also think is fascinating is that the Good Samaritan is also part of our legal system. There are what are known as Good Samaritan laws, which is incredible to me. So in some states, it's actually required that if you drive by and you see someone on the side of the road and they need help, you are required by state law to stop and ask them, do you need help? If someone sees you drive by, they could report you for actually breaking the law. You are required at all times to be a good Samaritan. I don't know what this says about Massachusetts. This is not required <laughs> in Massachusetts. Um, I won't go there. Um, but what is required in Massachusetts, or what is part of our good Samaritan law, is that if you do stop and you try to help someone and something bad happens, they can't hold you liable. So if I'm driving on the, on the road and I see someone who somehow had a seizure, they're passed out, I take them out, I try to you know, resuscitate them, I do CPR, I do mouth to mouth, and they die, they couldn't sue me, right, for, for not successfully resuscitating this person. If I broke their rib, they couldn't sue me for doing so, right, because I was in the right here, I'm trying to be a good Samaritan to them. So that's how the law works in Massachusetts. But it's sort of interesting, that's how famous this parable is that it literally, you can even Google it, Good Samaritan Laws, and you can see by state who requires what. Um, it's really interesting. But basically, the Good Samaritan, like many parables, it's centered around proper behavior. 
So it's considered by the biblical scholars to be an exemplary story. What that means is the main part of the story is setting an example for us of proper behavior and improper behavior, right? It's all about behavior in this story. This story also has sort of a once upon a time feel about it. You notice the lawyer asks Jesus a question and he, he doesn't even really answer, he tells a story, right? And his story is his answer. But it all stems from the question that the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? It really means, where can I draw a line? Where can I make a distinction? How big does my circle have to be? And he wants the answer, you get the feeling, to be, oh, well, your neighbors are these people, but not those people. So you don't have to love those people. You just have to love these people. But Jesus obviously doesn't buy into that very well. I think it's also important to put the scripture in context is that putting people into categories was really important for ancient people. Sometimes I think it's just as important for modern people. But putting people in categories was really important. So basically in Jewish society, there were three traditional divisions. There were priests, the very top. There were Levites, who were in the middle. And there was the rest of Israel at the bottom. Levites, just so you know, were, were of the tribe of Levi, and they basically were helpers of priests. They, were, they helped with traditional sacrifices and stuff. So those are the three divisions. Priests, Levites, rest of Israel. So if you're in Jesus' audience, and you're listening to the story, and there's three men with this Samaritan, you'd expect the third person to be your regular, everyday Jewish man, right? Because that is the third person in this hierarchy. Except, we get a Samaritan. Jesus' audience would have been totally thrown off by having the third person in the story be a Samaritan. Samaritans were despised. They considered themselves Jewish. Other Jews did not consider them Jewish. They only stuck to certain customs. They only kept a part of the Torah. And they didn't have their temple in Jerusalem. They had their temple at Gezer, and that's where they worshipped. So basically, you have this third person who is absolutely despised, and he's the one that helps in this story. What I find so interesting is actually the Samaritans are so rejected that when Jesus asks the question, which of you these three do you think proved the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The correct answer is just the Samaritan, right? Except the lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy. It has like this Harry Potter-esque, he who must not be named element to it. I mean, he doesn't even answer the Samaritan. The Samaritan is the neighbor. It's this kind of just angst and anxiety and, and just prejudice. And he doesn't even answer the Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy. That's the level um, of this conflict between the two people. So why I love this story? Because overall the question is just as applicable as it was back then and is today. Am I a neighbor to a person in need? That's, that's the ultimate question. Am I a neighbor to a person in need? And what I love about this is Jesus sort of kicks those categories out the window. Because we're basically not called to define who our neighbors are. Or maybe the definition of our neighbor is everyone. We're called to be a neighbor. Again, it's about the action, it's about the behavior, it's about the example. It's sort of this overarching, authentic call to love. We see in the scripture, too, the basic command we have in Christianity. Love God, love your neighbor. What Jesus does is he starts breaking down these distinctions that we try to make. When we ask the questions, but, who, but who's our neighbor? It's basically ignored because we're not supposed to necessarily sit here and define who our neighbors are. We're called to be the neighbor. So I was struck when I was researching this because I wanted to find some good modern examples of good Samaritan stories. 
And what I was struck by is that many of the examples I saw in our media in America were completely over the top, just extraordinary a buildings on fire and someone runs inside to rescue a family or a baby falls off a bridge and someone jumps into the water to save this child. And those, of course, are definitely good Samaritans. But I think that's a really steep standard <laughs> for any of us to, um, to put on ourselves. And, and maybe that's not a fair expectation. So what I was struck by is I started researching, I love the BBC, and so I was researching on the BBC about Good Samaritan stories. And I discovered two stories that were submitted by readers about who they feel in their lives have been Good Samaritans. And what's striking about these is their simplicity, that it can take just a little, little action that any of us can do to be considered a Good Samaritan. So the first was a man named John Tyndall. He was a theological student, and he was preaching 30 miles north of his seminary in the middle of winter. So he traveled on his motorcycle, because that's the only car he had, with his fiance on the back. They weren't dressed warmly enough. Remember, this is England in the winter. And so they ran out of fuel. He says, we stood at the side of the road, shaking with cold, not sure what to do. Suddenly, a passing car stopped just past us. The driver got out, popped his boot, which I think is trunk, <laughs> took out a gallon can of petrol, and poured it in my tank without saying a single word. He put the tank back in his boot and drove off. I love this. I just love this. And he, Tyndall was saying also in his submission that to this day, he and his fiance became his wife, they always wonder whether this was a person or an angel because it was that kind of an experience. He didn't say a word, just drove up, poured gas in, left. I love this, it's, so, it's, it's a story of the Good Samaritan. The other one I really liked from these submissions was a man named Ian Geddes. Um, he was drunk at a football game, soccer, between Millwall and Portsmouth, and a policewoman came over to arrest him for public intoxication. But instead of arresting him, on site, he started to have a conversation. He said, seeing that I wasn't disorderly, she asked if I was okay. I said, yes, fine, just having a good time. She said it didn't look like much fun, and she asked whether I drank often. <clears throat> Every day, he said, and he began to cry. She ended up touching his arm and telling him, stop drinking. Life is too good to drink every day. Two months later, he got sober, and he hasn't had a drink in 17 years. She didn't arrest him right on sight. She, in the words of the Good Samaritan, showed him mercy, and this ended up completely changing his life. For him, this policewoman was a Good Samaritan that has always stayed with him. So what I like about both of these instances is that they're not over the top, extraordinary. They're not things that maybe we couldn't do if we were in the same position. Well, we're not police, so maybe we couldn't arrest someone anyway. But I think you understand what I'm saying. These, these aren't examples of things that we couldn't do ourselves. What I like about them is that they both show immense compassion and understanding. They show living into this commandment to love our neighbors and not be obsessed all the time with defining who our neighbors are. So whether you're a sinner or a saint, whether you are struggling, or whether you see someone on the road who needs help, we're all worthy and called to this authentic love of being neighbors one to another. So I say, in words of Jesus, go and do likewise.